So in our first part of the lecture on chromosomes mapping and meiosis, when we're looking at the inheritance connection, we were talking about Thomas Horgan Munt and his research with fruit flies and kind of how he discovered certain traits and variations are associated with the sex chromosomes, particularly the X chromosome of the 23rd pair in humans. So just to re reinforce and reiterate, with females, they have two X chromosomes representing gender. Each of those chromosomes will carry an allele for various sex-linked traits. With guys, males have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. <clears throat> so with guys, there's only one allele carried on the X chromosome. The Y chromosome does not carry it. So again, get comfortable with how this works, how you can set up a genetic problem working with a sex-linked type of trait. Now, sometimes we see examples in organisms where one of the X chromosomes is actually inactive. It's, it's not functional. It's what we call a bar body. So if the female X is inactive, the other X has to pick up the slack, so to speak. So she's going to have two X chromosomes, one of those, for whatever reason, becomes inactive. It does not express the other chromosome. The other X chromosome for that 23rd pair will have to do, basically double up the expression. So an example of that occurs in cats. So there's genes associated with the color of the cat. So the X gene, or the X allele, can carry a variation that causes the cat coat color to appear orange, or it can actually appear black, depending upon the expression of those alleles. Now, in most cats, it's black or it's orange. It's one or the other. But in cats where one of those chromosomes are inactive, for whatever reason, it becomes what we call the bar body, then the first chromosome has to double up. So it creates this, what we call the calico color in cat, kind of this patterned or splotchy distribution, uneven distribution of pigment, and we get the orange or the black and that variation of color. So it's not that widespread in humans as far as we know at this point, but we don't know if future research may lead to new conclusions. Okay, so as we're looking at genetics, we want to keep in mind with chromosomes, not everything fits the regular rules. Not everything that we know fits the standard. It's got to be on this chromosome and it works this way and this allele equals this particular trait. The exceptions that we know of today, and I'm willing to bet this will change. It'll, we'll find more exceptions, but two exceptions to the rules are the mitochondria, and the chloroplast. So in animals, we contain the mitochondria. That's our little powerhouse in our cell, the little engine that produces ATP. <clears throat> in producers, they contain chloroplasts. They can also contain mitochondria. But their chloroplasts are their primary energy powerhouses, how they make ATP. And what we see with the mitochondria and the chloroplast, they actually have DNA. They have a separate DNA code that is not found in the nucleus. It's different DNA. And that DNA is completely derived from your mother. So moms pass to their children the genetics for their mitochondria. The mitochondrial DNA comes from the mom. So you think about how this works. When mom is making an egg through that process of meiosis, her cell divides in half, and that contains mitochondria, Golgi bodies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> and then it divides again. The egg is going to contain those mitochondria. The sperm cell doesn't contain it. It doesn't have mitochondria in the part that actually brings the DNA into the egg cell. There's mitochondria in the sperm structure, but it's not going to be passed to the zygote. So mom's mitochondria are the ones that are constantly being replicated. So everybody, when you guys are looking at your mitochondria, that is your maternal DNA. So it's a way to track relatedness on your mother's side by looking at mitochondrial DNA. And it's one of those things, geneticists went, wow, this just 
doesn't fit the regular genetic rules. Uh, an example of how we apply this is this thing called Lieber's optic neuropathy, or neuropathy, L-H-O-N. So if you inherited bad mitochondria, they were not functional for whatever reason, they're not optimally working, then you don't generate ATP. And if this occurs in those neural cells, particularly of the eye, the optic nerve, then it leads to degeneration of that neural tissue, which means you're going to lose your eyesight. You're going to lose your vision and you're not going to be able to see. So you can progressively move towards a form of blindness because of an inherited bad mitochondria that unfortunately you were passed during fertilization. Okay, so like I said, not everything fits the rules. Now, as we continue to delve further into genetics and more and more scientists explore this, we're finding out that we can actually map out the genome. A lot of this has been done for certain species, but there still is tremendous work to be done here. So genetic mapping is looking at the distance between genes on a particular chromosome. So our example here, C1, 2, 3, all the way through C8. Those are genes. Those are the DNA codes, the strips of A, T, Cs, and Gs. Those translate over into amino acids, transcribe, translate into amino acids, and give us our amino acid chain, our protein. So we're identifying where these genes are on a chromosome, and then how much space is it to the next gene, and the next gene, and then the next. Because what we know at this point, we use a very small percentage of our genome. Let me add this in here for you guys. So we are using, we only use, a pro, it's estimated approximately 2 to 3 percent of the genome is actually used. So there's a whole bunch of DNA out there that, oh, sorry, let me get back to that, that we don't know what it does. We're not sure yet. We're trying to figure this out. So huge opportunities and exciting opportunities for you guys as biologists if this is an area of interest. There's always going to be opportunities in the genetic field. So genetic mapping is playing a big role in figuring out where these traits are at, where these variations exist, and this is what we use when we start manipulating species with biotechnology. So as we move into our next unit on biotechnology, we're going to come back to gene mapping and looking at how we cut out pieces of DNA from particular locations on the chromosomes. So just an example here with our fruit flies again, I'm looking for certain variations, black body, gray body versus what they call vestigial wings, which are these curly little folded up wings versus normal wings. And if we can identify where those variations exist or where those alleles exist, we can make stronger predictions on what will be passed to the offspring. But it again opens up this incredible window of opportunity with genetic engineering. Uh, SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, are pieces of information that are helping us with genetic analysis, crime scene analysis, etc. A SNP affects a single base of a particular gene. So we go, okay, this gene is located on this chromosome, and the blood of the suspect was sampled, the blood of the victim was sampled, and then the blood from the crime scene was sampled. And they can use these little SNPs. They're just tiny, tiny little variations. They're basically genetic thumbprints or genetic fingerprints. We can use that to possibly support a crime scene analysis to convict somebody or better, better scenario to say, no, that person is not guilty of this crime because his DNA does not match what was collected at the crime scene. So you guys will see this as you progress into further classes. You'll talk more about SNPs and the single nucleotide polymorphisms. But here's the big picture. This is where it gets really fun and really exciting. Um, human genetic disorders. We've mapped out various genes and mapped out various chromosomes to identify different disorders. So if somebody has a certain disorder, like hemophilia, we know where it should be located on the chromosome. Can we fix this? 
Or if you're concerned, did you inherit this disorder? You don't know. We know which chromosome to go look for if we're going to try to explore muscular dystrophy. We'll go to this X chromosome and this particular gene location, what we call loci. So a lot of great, great opportunities and information is being derived from working more with <clears throat> these uh, the genetic mapping. Um, some major genetic disorders that have been discovered and identified are things like cystic fibrosis. This is caused by, and I want you guys to fill in the blanks here, cystic fibrosis is a faulty protein channel in your cell membrane. So the DNA doesn't produce the correct shape protein. So a protein channel for cystic fibrosis. Sickle cell anemia, faulty hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is a protein structure that carries oxygen within the red blood cells. It's messed up, and that's what causes sickle cell anemia. Tysacs, faulty lysosome. So that little garbage truck that moves around the cell and keeps the cell clean and safe is not doing its job. It's incorrectly. It doesn't function correctly. Hemophilia is <clears throat> a bad clotting mechanism. The proteins don't form correctly, and you don't clot your blood. Huntington's disease, neurological cell degeneration. So those cells break down. They don't work correctly. So all these genetic disorders have an association with faulty or changed pieces of DNA that you inherited, unfortunately, and that causes the expression to occur and leads to those problems. So again, sadly, with most of these things, life expectancy is shortened, the quality of life is compromised significantly, and we need to try to figure out how to hopefully solve some of these or improve quality of life for people who inherit these genetic disorders. Okay, So sometimes when we're looking at genetics, people gain additional pieces of information or they're lacking pieces of information. So this occurs because of an, of an event called non-disjunction. So make sure you guys get the definition here. Non-disjunction is when your chromatids don't separate during meiosis. This does not happen in the cell cycle. This is only associated with meiosis, making sperm or making eggs. Aneuploidy is the general term for the gain or loss of a chromosome. Now, if you've lost a chromosome, you are considered monosomic, or we say monosomy. So monosomy is loss. Mono means one chromosome instead of two. If you have an extra chromosome, that's when you've gained an extra one. We refer to that as trisomic or trisomy. So you actually have three chromosomes instead of two. So it's problematic if non-disjunction occurs during meiosis and the chromosomes don't split into chromatids correctly, then your cells, your eggs and sperm can have an <clears throat> abnormal number of chromosomes. And that is not a healthy thing for an individual to have. So if you look at the karyotype or the DNA analysis of a trisomic individual, this is what it would look like. So here's a human male, chromosome pair 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way through pair 23. We know it's a male because X and Y. But at the 21st pair, there's an extra chromosome. There should not be three there. There should only be two. That is what leads to Down syndrome. Down syndrome, or trisomy 21, is the most common because that's the one that survives. Most of the others do not survive. Now, we do see trisomy happening on the sex chromosomes, and I'll show you some examples of that in a little bit here. But here's our general characteristics and traits when we associate an individual with Down syndrome. The risk of a child being born with Down syndrome increases as the maternal age increases. And there's this linear increase here as women get into their mid to late 30s and into their mid 40s, that likelihood or rate increases. Um, but because non-disjunction has occurred, that resulting offspring has inherited an extra piece of DNA. It leads to all those developmental issues associated with trisomy.